What is the transfer of stimulus control and what is the transformation of stimulus control and why do we need to know these terms? Yo, I'm Ryan No, behavior analyst and creator. All things behavior analysis is what you find on this channel. Welcome. We nerd out on psychology here, and when it comes to learning, there are a few key processes that really everyone should know because the things that you do day to day, every day, are affected through these. To illustrate, I'm gonna draw here on my tablet a little bit, so bear with me, you know, I'm not the best drawer. Remember Pavlov, the late 19th and early 20th century, he and his lab investigated reflexes heavily. We're talking hundreds of thousands of research studies that were conducted in his lab. And what they found was that when certain events happen close in time together, the properties of these different things could start to transfer. So the story goes that there were dogs who began to salivate at the sight of the lab workers' coats because they were feeding them quite frequently. So let's explain how this could happen. I'm gonna demonstrate real quickly here by drawing this out. So what was going on with Pavlov and the dogs is there was food that was being presented and it was leading to salivation. We call it sal for short, okay? So the food is what they call an unconditional stimulus that led to an unconditional response. And this whole thing, this stimulus response relationship is what we would call a reflex, all right? This reflex relation is something that is a part of our, uh, our, our behavior as a result of being a member of a species, okay? We all have these reflexes. Think about patellar, your eye blinks, your uh, salivation response, your heart rate increase, your moral response, suckling responses, all of these count, okay? And what Pavlov discovered and what they really investigate is that what happens is you compare this unconditional stimulus, that is the food, and you could pair that repeatedly with a neutral stimulus. Let's say something like the lab coats. So you'd have something like food, and you would have the lab coats, and you would have that happen in close in time, and then they would also deliver the food itself. So what we have going on here is that we have the unconditioned stimulus being paired with the neutral stimulus that leads to the unconditioned response. Unconditional stimulus, neutral stimulus, and an unconditioned response of the salivation. What happens is through repeated pairings of this, that neutral stimulus starts to transfer into having similar properties. So it becomes what we call a conditional stimulus that leads to a conditional response. Now this conditional response is the same in form of the unconditioned response. So it is still salivation. This sort of process is what we call Pavlovian conditioning. And this is what they discovered and what they ran through the hundreds of thousands of experiments in his lab. Now there's one other thing that can happen here, which is you can start to pair this conditional stimulus again and again. So you could pair it with different things. They did a tone, like a different sound. And something fascinating was discovered when they started to pair these with more and more things. What they realized is that the unconditioned stimulus would elicit a certain amount of response. Let's just say that out of a possible of, I don't know, 100 different milliliters of salivation in our example with the dogs here, that this is how much you would get from the unconditioned stimulus, unconditional stimulus from that dog. And then they look at the first thing that you paired, such as the lab coats. And they look at the second thing that you pair, such as uh, the tone and on and on and on. And what you would get as you paired more and more of these is you always had a decrease in the amount that happened as you paired successfully further and further into more and more conditional stimuli. This continued conditioning is the first important thing to note. Each successive pairing of the conditional stimulus with another neutral stimulus results in the transfer of the stimulus control. That is the effects that it has as salivation in our example, but it does so to a lesser degree. The magnitude always decreases as you continue this process of conditioning further down the line. But, but, there was a study, well, actually a series of conceptual articles and empirical studies in the 1980s and 1990s that found that this process could be affected and you could make things either increase or decrease. And the question becomes how? Well, in short, it's language. This is overly simplistic for the sake of communicating and clearly and just quickly for a YouTube video. But when you relate things, say in ways like saying five is more than seven or seven is less than 10, Something happens where we learn to behave with respect to these relations of more or less through repeated practice and trials of learning through, say, many of my number examples being presented to you. You can start to learn as a result to respond to more or less in other contexts without any learning. So perhaps you're cooking with a friend and asked to get something out of the pantry. You go to the pantry and you see two options there. Same item, two options. You ask which one, just for clarification. And you know what that means? Because of the history of learning more and less under different circumstances in the past, you can now discriminate which one is more in the presence of two different items with one being more and one being less. Now, how exactly this happens is different for each of us. You might've learned more or less in a different way than I did 
did. We all probably learned slightly different ways, but we all have the ability to do this if we have languaging skills. So why does this matter? Researchers looked at teaching things like this, more or less relations to arbitrary stimuli, which is just a fancy way of saying the things that we haven't yet learned, they're just novel to us, and something unexpected happened. So the famous article that I'm gonna demonstrate this through and just like drawing really quickly, is they did something like A is less than B is less than C. All right, they teach you relations, right? And in my example, that was five, seven, and 10. But for the sake of this, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make some weird squiggly lines. So it would say this bloop is less than a glob, is less than a blurk. All right, let's pretend that these are all distinctly easy to discriminate. I know I made them the same. <laughs> So blurk, glob, bloop, I don't remember what I called them now, right? We would train these relations such that these things would start to be very clear to somebody that one is more than the other and one is less than the other. Um, really two is more than the other and two are less than the other. But anyhow, you sort out these three different relations, right? What the researchers did is they actually provided a mild shock to B and they measured the conditional emotional response. That is your galvanic skin response, which is like how much you sweat and an increase in heart rate and blood pressure. Those sort of things happen in those conditions. And they looked at the degree to which that happened. And note here that the shock never happened on A or C. There was no shock on these. It was only on B. And they did a presentation of the A stimulus and the C stimulus, and they measured the uh, galvanic skin response in that situation. And what they found was because of that past history that there was actually more of a galvanic skin response, right? That uh, sweatiness that you get as a result of um, the sort of conditioned emotional responses, there was more in the C condition without ever experiencing shock in the C condition or shock in the A condition, with it being less here and more here, that happened. This completely flipped everything. Since this was a different phenomenon compared to what Pavlov had found, that is different things happened with, from the scientific perspective, we needed to call it something else. Hence, the difference between transfer of stimulus functions and the transformation of stimulus functions. And this applies far beyond that study that looked at it through conditional emotional responses. It's been discovered to work under basically every situation in which language happens. And that is like a mind blowing concept if you think about that. And while we all experience it in our daily lives, that doesn't mean that we are necessarily aware of it. This has a whole lot of implications. If you can think of one, I'd love to hear it down below and let me know what you want more on this topic. I know that there's a lot here. It has massive implications for things like mental health, trauma, basic learning and instruction, darn near everything that we do. So transfer of stimulus functions or stimulus control happens successfully as you pair them further and further with less and less of that transfer actually happening and transformation of stimulus control has seen that through language, you can actually alter those in ways that map on to the ways that we use our language. Fantastic implications. I hope you learned something today. Let me know if I missed anything down below. Thank you so much. Supporting can be done th so through the top link in the description. It is Patreon. And thank you so much. That is your daily BA. Oh, like, share, subscribe. That's important too. It, like, it seriously makes a difference if you just hit that like button. It helps to spread. So please help disseminate.